This episode originally aired on November 19th, 2022 on the Unethical Patreon. When you described angina, it sounded like a robot trying to describe getting broken up with. Mild heart discomfort. <laughs> <laughs> Is that the new narrative that Rick's a robot? He's not a vampire anymore? Dude, I fucking wish. You guys ready for this? I know. You, you've, you've got long hair now, RJ. So you're already f- had it up to here. You're already fed up. I'm, I'm sporting a mustache. That's going to be hard to look at the whole time. <laughs> Plus, this is the last episode of Jack the Ripper. Will this make you explode? Will it, No. This is still Jack the Ripper? This is our last Jack the Ripper, yeah. Holy it, shit. Oh, shit. It made Rick explode just now. I thought we were done, but... Yeah. No, we're not. We're not done after that today. Spoiler alert. He's still ripping. Still ripping? Oh, yeah. He's still, yeah, he's yeah. still out there ripping. <laughs> That's actually a really fun theory. I hope that comes up at the end. <laughs> he's been doing it for millennia. I promise we're not doing another episode. Okay, this is it. I, you guys okay. aren't doing another episode. I might. Oh, I'm, I have like six or seven left, and I can't not <laughs> say them to someone. Six or seven? <laughs> what? I don't have uh, uh, above today's that I cut out, so that might happen with Celeste or something uh, for a bonus for fun. But you, we're all the, the main episode's done. These the other ones are ridiculous ones that I just okay. Something has to be said to, about them. There's a guy with that made wigs. He was the wig maker. <laughs> the wig maker? That is yeah. a very 1800s London job. <laughs> Look, we got all these fucking barristers and judges, man. There's a market empty there. <laughs> no wonder people don't let this, this case die. It's because there's so many things to talk about. You just drag it on forever. That's It's the, <laughs> it's the funnest true crime thing because you could just say whatever. He, he came in from a spaceship, murdered. You could People would be like, there'd be four or five guys would be like, yeah, that happened. Like, are you serious? I was joking. So <laughs> who knows what kind of thing we're going to add to the pile today on this one. The thing that just gets released before this episode, though, is the interview with Mudgett. So that, I'm not going to even talk about H.H. H. Holmes. I uh, did an interview with Jeff Mudgett. H.H. H. Holmes' is great, great, great grandson. He thinks H.H. H. Holmes was Jack the Ripper. So if you guys want to go listen to that, give her between episode season two episode three and four so if you got this when this comes out public if you want to go back and listen to it it's there okay an elite team of private detectives what if balloons are aliens like maybe that's the key component we're missing cover-ups john's guilty mysteries that need to be solved maybe mormons need mountains richard shut up let's do it here do you guys remember anything <laughs> um from three weeks ago um <laughs> no <laughs> okay you guys will probably remember things as i say it yes yeah i'm I, i'll tell you this though i have an excellent uh way of faking like i have remembered well, everything so that's okay that's fine i'll do that all right so first guy we're gonna do today i mentioned him in the first episode his name was Chal- charles allen lechmere or cross or whatever the fuck that guy's name is. Remember just oh yeah, yeah. No, I totally remember good old Charlie Charlie <laughs> Lechmere. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Sounds like it. Um, <laughs> anyways, he was one. Of, he was a cart driver that found the first person murdered, and then that other guy. And then he poked him with the whip. Remember that guy? Mm-hmm. Now you actually remember that or no? Well, okay. You can't it's put me to... on the spot. Then I can't do a good job of faking it. <laughs> I actually oh. remember it. Please continue. Enlighten him. That's okay. There's just the guy found, he found the first victim and he like poked her with his, his uh, whip going like you alive. And then somebody else. All right. Through. Yeah. The whip bit that, yeah. that I remember. Yep. Yeah. So he's, he's actually uh, a, like during the time he was just considered an inner, innocent guy crossing a bucks row. But in 2000, when an issue of Ripperama magazine published an article by Derek Osborne, he suggests that, Charles Lechmore could be the Ripper. And I do like this one. For, today's going to be the stronger sub- suspects, in my opinion. I don't think any of them are really that strong. Neither mm-hmm. is the stronger one. So I'll give you the reasons I actually think this is a viable guy. Are we, are we going to skate by the fact the name of that magazine is Ripperama? Yeah, Ripperama magazine. Yeah, that's a, a Ripper based Jack the Ripper magazine. That's awesome. What would, what would like the Jeffrey Dahmer magazine? The... Muncherama. Muncherama. (laughs) (laughs) 
uh, <laughs> Damarama. Dom, Damarama is good too. Sounds like he's like uh like a like the Dalai Lama. It's the Damarama. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sounds a very peaceful man. Yeah. That, that Jeffrey Damarama. Osborne and a few others have put together a pretty solid theory suggesting that Charles Lechmere or Cross, whatever the fuck that guy's name is, is in fact the Ripper. Maybe re- responsible for another murder that happened around the same time, the Thames Torso murder. You probably don't remember that, but it's the dude getting chopped up, the, the chick getting chopped up and only finding the part, like parts of her. They don't even know who it was. They're on Buck's Row. He's carting down Bar- Buck's Row and then he runs into a guy named Robert Paul. Robert Paul is coming further behind Cross when he noticed a man standing where the woman was. When Cross saw Paul coming his way, he stopped staring and poking the body with his whip and brought over his new buddy so he could have a poke too. Initially, neither men claimed to have seen any blood at the time when they first poked her with the whip. But when the police officer got there, the constable got there, there was a considerable amount of blood pooling around Nichols' neck. So this suggests that when the two men were looking at Nichols, her neck wound was fresh and the blood had not had the chance to pool yet. So she was just murdered. So neither man had reported seeing anyone else in Bucks Row that night. Bucks Row is a very narrow street with only one exit on either side. So there would have been nowhere for like anyone to have escaped past these two guys. So whoever they saw, that's who was there that day. If the wound was so fresh and no one else was around, it just leads to think that Lechmere actually killed this lady. Uh, he's just standing there watching her bleed out. Paul just caught him in the act. And he put his head like, oh, look what I found. You know what I mean? Like, I just found a body. Like, okay. <laughs> cool, man. Poker with the fucking whip. When Cross or Lechmere, or the fuck this guy's name is, notices Paul, he pretends he just found a body. Since Lechmere went as Cross on the streets, his name was actually Lechmere, but he told everyone it was Cross. The police couldn't figure out where this guy was to ask him more questions after the fact when they were doing the inquest. They knew a guy, Lechmere, was there or whatever, or they knew a guy, Cross, was there, but he wasn't in any of the registries for anyone, so they couldn't go even find him. So he was never actually talked to mm. again. I don't think that's that suspicious. I mean, everybody who's named Lechmere changes their name to Cross. You know, there's David, um, the comedian, David Lechmere. You know, now he goes by David Cross. Uh, the popular rap group in the 90s, Chris Lechmere, uh, became Chris <laughs> Cross. So. Okay. Yeah, no, I guess you're probably right. It's not, yeah, just nobody likes the name Lechmere, especially the ones who were born with it. So they okay. change it. <laughs> yeah, they should have. They should have known David Cross. Mm-hmm. Those constables, they could have found him easy. It's like easy interchangeable. Come on. <laughs> they figured out that Lechmere was actually this Cross guy. The researchers in 2000, when they were like looking for names of people who would have been carting in those hours, and they kept finding this Lechmere guy, but he was never mentioned. And then Cross didn't exist. And then they started finding where Cross existed. And then Lechmere was supposed to be up. So anyways, they figured out that fuckheads that like in 2000. So this guy's just like kind of mm. a newish one. Then they started doing, I don't know if we talked, we talked about geographic profiling last time. I'm not going to get into it that much. They're doing geographic profiling on this guy. And they put him as a likely suspect with the geographic profiling. The movements, all the burgers were around his like house where he would go to work back and forth pretty convincing in a way this geographic profiling but i mean you're just guessing too like you don't know where that guy was 100 and fucking so many years ago the investigator that did the geographic profiling says that after his revelation lechmere is the most likely suspect for the jack the ripper killings uh there's just lots of problems with this why did the killing stop usually dudes like this will ramp up and ramp up until they get caught or die or something like that they sometimes have like cooling periods but like Usually they just kill later again. It's not like it stops forever. This guy lived to like 70, 71. This Charles Lechmere guy. Hmm. Yeah, but but how do you know he didn't kill people? I agree. I mean, if if he got away with that, I mean, maybe he just shifted tactics and continued to get away with it. Maybe. Like, there's so much murder and stuff and no one's... A lot of policing was just relied on like, did you see anything? Or your hands are covered in blood, you know? So probably. Yeah, maybe he just like casually changed his name again. And they were like, no, no, no. See, these murders are signed uh, Smith, not not Cross. It couldn't be that guy. Yeah, it's not the same guy. Yeah. The only reason he's compelling to me in any way is the fact that Bucks Row is fucking tiny. And like, if you just found the girl with no blood and then she's got lots of blood, like, it looks like you did it, man. Like, that's what it looks like to me. Mm -hmm. That chick, anyway. 
other than that, though, there's a lot. It's just like a big stretch to like make Lechmere cross. Like they just went like, I have cross referenced a bunch of work things from a hundred and some years ago. Like mm, RJ said it in an episode before, like he doesn't trust anything that happened before 1971. Yeah, no, all of recorded history prior to that is completely unreliable. <laughs> All right, this next one, uh, we'll just move on from him. This next one, I'm going to need your help, RJ. You have to read okay. some stuff for me. Not RJ, sorry, Rick. I don't know why I said oh. RJ. Yeah, that's, wow, I was, was confused. I was like, he knows I don't know how to read. Yeah. <laughs> no, this one's going to be a good one. So when I get to parts, I'm going to send you, like, what to read in the in your chat. Okay? <laughs> okay. So I had I closed my Facebook. I'm opening it back up. So Francis Thompson's this guy's name. He's an English poet that some people believe is actually a ripper suspect. A little bit of history on him. He was in medical school when he was 18. So that gives him the, the credibility for like the medical knowledge, if that's even a thing. Uh, he gave that up at the age of 26 to pursue his poetry and writing career. Thompson spent three years on the streets of London doing labor jobs and milking cash from his sex worker of a girlfriend. After that, actually, she was actually pumped to do it. Like, here, I'll help you with your writing, buddy. I'll go suck some dicks for you. Damn. Yeah, she was down for that's, it. That's the dream. That's the dream. <laughs> Thompson got sick uh, while he was living on the streets, and he got prescribed opium to deal with his pain. Today, as old as time, he gets to be a drug addict after this. Eventually, his girlfriend leaves him. She's like, I ain't no sucking no more dicks for you. I'm done. Oh, okay. So why, why is she suddenly a racially charged black stereotype? I don't know why you think that was black. <laughs> I don't feel like I'm the problem. I feel like you're the problem with that. <laughs> I mean, I don't know where that voice came from. It's 1800s London. Good. Your lawyer trained you well. Deflect, deflect, deflect. That was just me doing a character. I didn't put any race to it at all. <laughs> hmm. And what, what ethnicity would this character happen to be? I didn't even think about it. I don't know. I'd have to think for a while. Wow. It happens without even thinking about it. Man. <laughs> Whatever. Proceed. This was supposed to be his like motivation, Thompson's motivation for uh, the Whitechapel sex workers for killing them uh, under the name Jack the Ripper. Even though Thompson was basically a homeless addict, he was still writing poetry. In 1888, he showed his poetry to Wilfred and Alice Maynell, and they saw the talent that Mr. Thompson had. They offered to let him stay with them to get off the streets and to be able to write in a safe place. And writing he did. He published his work in 1893. The Maynells were very Christian people, and they were the editors of a very Christian magazine. So Thompson moved out of the Maynells and lived as a recluse after he got his own place. He kept publishing new works, but he was seldom seen at social gatherings. He wasn't even considered prolific while he was alive. He just wrote a bunch of people after his death, though, his fame came. Uh, J.R. Tolkien called him an inspiration, and so did a few other notable authors that came after this. Tolkien compared him to Arendelle comparing their similar burning enthusiasm for etherly fair. I just love this shit. Thompson is more known for his poem, The Hound of Heaven. Uh, and this is so like famous at certain points that like Catholics kids used to have to memorize it for class. So anyways, in 1888, Dr. Joseph C. Rupp, who was the medical examiner for the Nuances County, Texas, wrote an article in the criminologist fingering Mr. Thompson as the Ripper one century after the fact. Dr. Rupp makes a few valid points about his suspicions, but the accusations get crickets for 27 years until an Australian author named Richard Patterson calls up Rupp to ask him a few questions about his article. In Patterson's 2015 book, Francis Thompson, a Ripper suspect, he lays out all the evidence he amassed with Mr. Thompson as the Ripper. Patterson did his own research that led him to the conclusion, but called Rupp to get some additional info. So the evidence that Patterson has come up with is this. First of all, Thompson's medical knowledge. He took six years of medical school, which was three times the amount needed to become a doctor in those times. And it wasn't because he wasn't good at medicine. His sister remarked that he loved to dissect corpses so much that he didn't want school to end. According to his sister, Thompson would pay extra to have more cadavers to dissect again that day. Like when they did in the afternoon, he's like, I get to do another one. And when it came to final exams, Thompson would just show up late to the tests and he would automatically fail because of it. He would just purposely fail so he could do that dissecting course again and again. <laughs> so Thompson would have caught up in a human, that's what I'm saying. When Mary Kelly was killed, Thompson had been living in the same address. So Mary Kelly was the last one, the fucking brutal one. 
there are rumors that Thompson and Kelly knew each other and were friends. That being said, Thompson was living in the streets, messed up with opium within a mile of all the canonical murders. Patterson also pointed out that within his research, he found out that Thompson used to carry around a surgical knife under his coat. He kind of suggested it might've been for protection, but I mean, Mm, I mean, like the 1800s are borderline lawless. I feel like there's a lot of things you could have just openly, like you're telling me there weren't people just walking around with great swords back then. For sure. Battle axes. Yeah. Like, cause I mean, if anything, like protection would be a deterrent, you know, you just have like a massive fucking, like, you know, broadsword just like hanging over your shoulder like it's a boom box or some shit totally. and then everyone's like oh i'm not gonna fuck with that guy scalpel that's tiny you hide that you have intent with that that's true i i, I people had guns and shit too right would be guns like you, did, did they i don't i don't I'm know to think when 1890s would be that gun, 1880s. guns were like well because like wild west is like what i think i have to i have to americanize this in order oh, to oh yes that's right yeah so yeah yeah they probably had like revolvers and shit i don't know yeah. maybe yeah, it's just a weird... Definitely had rifles. Anyways, this guy had a scalpel ball in him all the time, apparently. I don't know. But Thompson wasn't a Christian poetry-only type of poet. Uh, while poor and addicted on the streets, homeless, Thompson wrote some pretty bleak poetry. You said poor and addicted, but you really abridged poor and. It sounded like you said porn addicted. <laughs> I agree. I thought you were Thank saying you. the dude had a porn habit. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that was a real hyphenization of those two words. Yeah. <laughs> and then you brought that up because I, uh, I, I was. What kind of porn did they have back there? Clickety clickety clickety. Yeah. What did you say? <laughs> that was like twenty minutes ago. Yeah. In order, it's not. It's not. It's not like Google searching. They have to sit down with a guy and describe what they want to see so he can draw it. <laughs> so long. <laughs> Patterson starts reading some of Thompson's poetry written around the time of the Whitechapel murders. And he found some pretty crazy stuff. So just before the murders began, Thompson wrote a poem where a knight stalks a pretty woman and disembowels her. And it's entitled Nightmare of the Witch Babies. And it's one of the first poems submitted to his editor for the magazine on February 23rd, 1887, which I find hilarious because that was a Christian magazine. Hmm. They told him it was too dark and it can't be printed. I think the first time it was actually ever printed was like in 2002 poetry book by Bridget Boardman uh, even she put it like a collection of his but she puts it poems published elsewhere I just can't figure out where it was actually first published so huh that that makes me so mad that like a potentially horrible murderer could have gotten his dumb 1800s poetry published and and I've been banging my head against the wall trying to get a short story published for like two years now I'll be so upset if that he's actually Jack the Ripper. Uh, <laughs> I just you can't have everything that I want to have. You get to kill innocent women and get your stories published. Well, how come you can't? How come you can't just go kill some chicks and then he'll probably be more prolific? That's half know. of everything I want, Richard. It's not all of it. He had it all. <laughs> all right. All right, Ricky. I'm going to send you a bit of this poetry. <laughs> okay. You're making Rick read the poetry. <laughs> Just a flat, unaffected voice, please. <laughs> a lusty knight, ha, ha, on a swart steed, ho, ho, rode upon the land where the silence feels alone. Also, for the record, I'm sure it sounds a lot better when you can actually tell what order the shit's supposed to go in. Shut up. It sounds perfect. Keep reading. <laughs> If I press enter, it just sends it. Shift, enter, shift, enter, boomer, come on. Is that part of the poem? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So then it goes, yada, yada. Oh, it continues. Oh, there's more. Uh, The knight rides through a desolate nightscape, streetscape. Then the knight catches sight of a beautiful woman. Here's some more of that poem. What is it sees he, ha ha, there in the frightfulness, ho ho. There he saw a maiden, fairest fair, sad were her dust eyes. I did, I'm not a poem guy. I don't think I could even read one more. That would send me up the wall. <laughs> I was just going to keep putting stuff and see if you'll do it. Uh, oh, my <laughs> God. Oh my yeah. God. <laughs> he already gave up. I was hoping for like four or five stanzas before he gave up, but that's great. All right. So he sees this this girl. Then he starts moving into stalking. He's like... Thank you. 
Swiftly, he followed her. Ha ha! Eagerly, he followed her. Ho ho! Then the knight starts to call her a witch and unclean, which I find hilarious. But witch apparently just means you're dirty back then. I was looking that up. I was like, did he actually call her a witch? Really? Like, yeah, just a dirty, just dirty. Huh. There's two full stanzas reporting how like disgusting she is. Then he decides to kill her open. He starts to kill, tries to kill her by cutting her stomach open. Interesting. Because he wants to, because she's so gross. He thinks that if she has any offspring in there, I'm going to kill the offspring too. Just got to make sure. Huh. Such a gross witch. It ends with him finding out that there was two, two gross baby fetuses he killed. And its paunch was rent like a brassed drum and he blubbered fat from its belly doth come. It was a stream ran bloody under the wall. Oh stream, you cannot run too red under the wall. With a sickening ooze, hell made it so. Two witch babies, ho, ho, ho. Which I find awesome. Santa? Yeah. Is that the exactly. twist? It was Santa? <laughs> Santa the whole time. I'm sick of making kids these <laughs> these goddamn toys, so I'm killing them before I have to. Yeah, uh, that tracks. I would too. <laughs> Good on you, Santa. Stand up for yourself. You got this. Yeah, it also sounds like Thompson, like if you read the whole thing, I wasn't going to read the whole thing, but if you read the whole thing, it sounds like you wrote a poem about killing sex workers, honestly. Is that how it reads? Are you sure? It does. If you the read guy the guy who, who loved cutting up people? You sure there isn't some kind of metaphor there? Uh, I'm, I'm you not think, you think he for this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm implying there's not, and he's just a sick fuck. You can't, you can't take everyone's art and then make it into like their what they did in their real life, right? No. I, I mean, well, no, yes, you can't do that, but you also can't read too deeply into stuff. It's like the fucking stupid English teacher shit where it's like, yeah, like, of course we have to analyze some things but it spawned this whole generation of shitty assholes on youtube who want to tell you why spider-man's an allegory for jesus christ instead of just a guy with spider powers yeah and that's really what it is you know some you're right people just yeah. overthink a lot of shit but yeah not everything is a huge fucking thing like it fucking to kill a mockingbird pretty goddamn on the nose <laughs> and wonderful still yeah like it just doesn't make sense so well, creep who wrote about being a creep. There's a problem though with the whole th- with that theory because I agree with you. But when he died, Thompson died in, of tuberculosis in 1907. Patterson claims that his editor controlled all of his works until he died in 1948. So his editor also made up rumors that Thompson didn't like his medical studies, but like he started like I don't want people to think that he liked his medical studies. Uh, or he got more cadavers because he's a fucking Christian poem. He doesn't want to like the Christian, that big Christian poem that he had that everyone knew after that was super famous for. He didn't want to give him a bad name for that kind of stuff. And so uh, his editor also burnt and altered any poems or prose that didn't make Thompson look good because he was a drug addict. So altered. At, did, is there a chance that this guy could have known and, because he was how, like, did he just like alter away? a bunch of shit that he actually said, like I killed sex workers. Mm, That would be funny. It's just like, he keeps trying to write confessions to the police and then they just keep (laughs) accidentally going to his editor. And he's like, what the fuck is this? You're never going to be able to write poetry from jail. And I need money. I don't know. That's the, that's the whole thing of it. It's like the guy controlled his works for another 40 years. So who knows what that guy made up or released or whatever. There's no proof. Fair enough. There's no proof of it, but uh, it's pretty gross shit. And the guy had medical knowledge. That's a lot of these guys get pointed at because they had medical knowledge. And I even I think we even talked about yeah. that. How, like medical knowledge, like everyone would know where the liver was back then. You fucking well, it hurts on everybody. So yeah, they know where it is. <laughs> yeah, that's they it. can feel it. So it's kind of fun. Uh, this guy, it's just a, it's all poetry, and it's it's all just in just it's not it's circumstantial as fuck. I mean. I don't know. Uh, no, that that <laughs> here's the thing. I was expecting a really strong argument for why it wasn't him. And I don't feel like I heard it. The dude took you said he has medical knowledge, but that's like the biggest understatement. You see, he took it three times. That's true. Yeah, he does. He that. loved cutting people. But there's no there's nothing really actually put like, yes, he was drunk and fucked up on the streets on opium during that time. But like, so were a lot of people. Just because he wrote poetry? I, did, I'm sorry. Were we operating under the assumption that the guy murdering all of these women was stone sober? Because I was not. 
Uh, you're probably, probably right. I never even really thought of, that's not my point. What I'm trying to say, it's just like, there was a lot of people fucked up. A lot of people on the streets. It just because this guy wrote some poetry that people go like, aha, it must've been him because they probably weren't looking at him for this ever. They just looked into it Mm. after they went, I read this poem and he was, Mm. you know what I mean? Like, I don't fucking know. Okay. Yes. Mm. I, I don't doubt that whoever was fucking killing these people had some sort of, uh, inebriation whether it's like just mental illness or fucking drugs but something was going on right so this next guy is called montague Druitt. montague john Druitt had an upper middle class childhood being the son of a surgeon as an adult he was the assistant schoolmaster at a boarding school while pursuing a parallel career in law so he's studying both those at the same time dad was a surgeon so he must have learned some stuff is where people go with this guy is that, is that how surgery worked back then? You're going to take over the family business, son. <laughs> Come look what I'm doing in here because you're going to yeah. have to do this one day. <laughs> you have to learn. Yeah. Cut out the liver. Good boy. <laughs> Happy 10th. Yeah, you're 11. You know where the liver is. It hurts, right? <laughs> so he was studying law and teaching at the same time. In November 1888, Drew loses his job at the school and nobody it's not really clear as to why there is a quote from his brother saying that he lost his job because his brother had gotten to very serious trouble november 1888 was when the last murder was of mary kelly so was that the trouble early december 1888 drew was found dead in the river thames after about a month of being there so police considered Ooh. drew death a suicide hello was soup yeah wasn't much left to him and then in 1891, Henry Richard Farquharson, who was a member of the Parliament for West Dorset, announced that Jack the Ripper was the son of a surgeon who had committed suicide after the night of his last murder. Farquharson didn't directly say Druitt's name, but the description of the son of the surgeon was close to Druitt. Farquharson and Druitt ran in the same social circles, and because of their friendship, many others in their social circle thought that the accusation was probably true. Even some police officers got wind of the Druid thing, uh, that he could be the guy. Uh, a guy named Melville McNaughton. Now, McNaughton's pretty, does a lot. We're going to talk about him a bunch in this episode. Uh, he was the assistant commissioner of the London Metro Police from 1903 to 1913. Uh, he's f- probably most famously known for being the guy that got fingerprint evidence as like an acceptable way of identifying people. Like he convinced people that, yeah, fingerprints are fucking unique to each person. So they're good investigative technique guys. Hmm. He was also a critical player in the exoneration of a man named Adolf Beck, who which eventually led to the creation of the Criminal Court of Appeal in England in 1907. So fucking pretty epic dude, honestly. <laughs> like, yeah, fingerprints and appeals. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> for his time period i'm like this guy's impressive yeah you never would have convinced me that those were the same guy (laughs) that's so weird same dude for london yeah that's nuts that'd be like if eli whitney invented the cotton gin and then also like discovered how to like i don't know i can't even think of something different enough (laughs) yes they're both in criminal whatever but like it's just You'd have thought like some guy was like just looking at glass. He would have been like a like a watchmaker and noticed when he put his thumb on the glass of the watch to put it in and made an interesting design. He didn't invent it. He just heard about it and said, we could use this for policing. And everyone went, what? And he went, look. And then he made it a common practice in the police. It's not like he was the oh, guy. Okay, who, like, he like brought it to the police and said, let's use this as an investigative technique now. Hmm. By hearing about it, doing whatever fucking policing conferences and shit those guys who, used to. Who cracked fingerprints then? I don't know. I'll have to figure that out one day. That'll be the next mystery. On the next, Private Dicks. McNaughton's a funny dude, though, because at a certain point in his career, he told journalists that he knew exactly who Jack the Ripper was, but refused to tell them, give him a name, or give them any details on how the police might identify this man. Like, except for the man took his life in 1888. So I know who it is. I'm not telling you. He killed himself. Don't worry about it. It's fine. McNaughton's hmm. like his idea who Jack the Ripper was probably came from Farquharson because Farquharson was pretty big up. Like they all ran in the same circle. 
Uh, McNaughton later in life also claimed to have destroyed any files that were pertaining to the identity of Jack the Ripper. So he said, I'm going to death with it. <laughs> You'll never know. Well, you fucks. Why? Exactly. Why would you do that? If you actually knew, why would you do that? But I trust this guy enough because he like did some crazy shit in policing. I don't know what to think of this guy, but he wouldn't tell anybody. So his daughter. No, no, fuck that. Because like he, he uh, so because you, you misrepresented him initially. So he stole fingerprints was, <laughs> was the reality of it. So I already don't trust him. Um, And then now he's like, I know, but I'm not going to tell. Even though I work closely in the criminal justice system. Like, what the fuck? I agree. I don't know what the, like, there's theories as to why I didn't say anything. But my God, we'll we'll get to it in a bit. I I just don't, I don't get it really. Honestly, I want to be a good police officer. Give me one good reason and maybe I'll reconsider. But I cannot possibly imagine there is one. This is, I think it's, I think it's him being full of shit. We'll see it. Yeah. Like, like, there's a bit to, like, I don't think he knew exactly who it was, but I think he narrowed down pretty good. So, McNaughton's daughter, uh, Christabel, kept a major re- uh, report on the case that her father had written before he was commissioner and still a detective in 1890 regarding the Jack the Ripper case. Uh, and then 1959, Christabel gives the handwritten memo from Scotland to Scotland Yard for examination. So, everything he said he destroyed, well, guess what? His daughter stole one of them. In it, McNaughton highlighted the coincidence of the death between Druitt's disappearance and the death shortly after of Mary Kelly on November 9th. McNaughton also claimed to have private information, in quotes, that left little doubt, in quotes, that uh, even Druitt's friends and family thought that he was the Ripper. But even McNaughton, on to this memo, adds two other names that could be Jack the Ripper. He's like, it's definitely this guy or one of these two guys. And the other guys, because he said, writes a guy named uh, a Polish Jew named Kosminski and Michael Ostrog. And both will talk about them in a bit. So this me- memo was written specifically to argue against another suspect that we'll talk about later. So he, everyone kept bugging him like, I think it's this guy. And he's like, no, I'm writing a memo. <laughs> so we'll talk about that in a bit too. No actual physical evidence has ever proven Drew it to be the Montague Drew it to be the Ripper ever, like just circumstantial evidence. And the word of some rich and powerful guys in London at the time. Mm -hmm. The theory does explain a few things, like why the killing stopped. He was dead. Even though he wasn't a surgeon per se, maybe he could have picked up some stuff from his dad, like we said. Uh, Once you start to look at Druid as a suspect more thoroughly, though, you start to notice the flaws in him being a real suspect. But lots of people think Montague Druid's the guy. This is one of the main guys. But one of Druid's main things was he was a a cricket player. Uh, He played like in leagues and stuff like that. So if you go cross-reference the dates of the murders to his cricket matches, you start to notice that the dates Nichols and Chapman murder, Drew was out of town playing cricket. Maybe he wasn't, but he he definitely says he was. And on the date of the murders of Stride and Eddowes, like the double event, Drew was out of town in court defending a client in a court case. So there's proof of him like actually being at court. There is a slight possibility, like people, this is how they counteract that, that he could have just been in his office and using the train to run back and forth between the murder sites and where because the office was close by to where all the murders were basically in way chapel but like dude dude he's like two towns over he'd have to hit the trains and get back and forth just to make the murders happen so it's like it's and these murders were bloody like i said before and even though his office was walking distance from White Chapel, it's highly unlikely that the bloodstained clothes would have gone unnoticed by anyone commuting back and forth. I know that I said there was lots of butchers and stuff, but this guy was a fancy pants with fucking suits and shit. He couldn't have been walking around with blood all over him like the fucking local butchers. He would have been noticed for sure. No. Nah. No, nah, everyone had blood on him. Even the teachers? Yeah. Even yeah. The... <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. We'll keep Druid on there then. Another... Uh, an author named Stephen Knight claims in his book, Jack the Ripper, The Final Solution, that Druid is simply a scapegoat to get a very powerful man out of trouble. Let's talk about those guys as our next suspect. I think that's the that's the the from hell thing, right? The next guy, the next one's the from hell thing, yeah. Okay, all right. So, yeah, this is this this is the best conspiracy out of all of them. It has it all. It's got uh, love children, syphilis, and royalty. All the three things you need for a good story. And Johnny Depp. And Johnny Depp. <laughs> This is the big one that Prince Albert Victor, Duke of Clarence in Avondale, was Jack the Ripper. This guy was in line to be king, uh, but he died at a young age from a flu pandemic, so he never actually ended up being king. But from what I've read about Prince Albert Victor, Prince Albert Victor was, um, how do I put this? He was considered a dumbass, if not actually developmentally disabled. I think he... 
people were using the R word. His brain oh. was described in Royal Records as... Is that the R word, Royal? No, <laughs> no. I'm fine with it being synonymous with the other one. They're both the same. Uh, yeah. Just, yeah. <laughs> well, he's he's royalty. Yeah. So, you know. <laughs> Is that the new slur um, we're going to start? Royalty? They, they share genes with themselves. Oh, boy. His, uh, his brain was described in the Royal Records as abnormally dormant. <laughs> Damn. That is some old school roasting right there. Yeah, that is an excellent insult. So I'm pretty sure the royal family was probably happy he died early. Instead of getting educated, this guy was so dumb, the royal family just slipped old Eddie off into the Navy. He never saw any battle, but that's where he contracted syphilis. That's what they think on his trip to the West Andes. This is where the original theory begins, because there's a couple theories with this guy. This is the original one. So the original theory is that the prince went crazy with advanced syphilis and just couldn't help but kill people. And the royal family knew about it. So the royal physician, Dr. William Gull, informed the crown of his advancing form of syphilis and decided not to do anything until the double event. So they just said, oh, he's, he's let him be. He'll die now. We know, we're all happy he's going to die. The dumb, dumb Eddie, let him get syphilis and just die. But then he had the double event, the two kills one night. So then apparently Eddie was put into a private mental hospital until he broke out and went nuts on Mary Kelly. Then they caught him and he died from a syphilis, uh, not the flu like reported in the media. This theory is popularized from an article written in The Criminologist, written in 1970 by British physician Thomas Stowell. A lot of this theory comes from Dr. Gull's personal and private papers as source material, according to Stowell. The only problem is Stowell died within days of the article being published, and apparently Stowell's family burnt his research for the article. So they burnt mm. the... you got to trust what he said. He died a couple of days. Like, believe him. We're burning it. So no one can confirm any of this, but it's from the Dr. Gull's shit. So then it, it switches like the the theory starts to get a little bit mashed up so philip becomes like a side character for the murders right he's got a tutor always i don't know why he has a tutor in his older age but he definitely has a tutor wow yeah his tutor was a guy named james kenneth stephen and after a while of studies philip and stephen began a homosexual relationship that is why he had a tutor yeah yeah so he could put it in his tutor exactly <laughs> And then the royal family finds out that they're in this relationship and breaks them up because gay stuff is icky and you won't get any heirs that way. So stop with the icky stuff. Give me some kids. As a way of some revenge for he and Philip having to break up, he goes on a rampage and starts killing sex workers. So uh, it's the syphilis madness that got he got from Eddie. So he still had syphilis. So he gave it to his lover, his tutor guy, and the tutor went nuts and killed everyone because he's not allowed to have sex with Eddie anymore well that's fucking dumb yeah same story just love her stupid then he gets to star as killer again 1976 so morphs back as he's the killer again so Stephen Knight the book I was talking about earlier Jack the Ripper the final solution expanded on this theory just taking out the syphilis altogether okay it turned into the prince secretly married a lowly catholic shop girl named Ann, Annie Crook and he had a baby with her so he's out slumming with the locals has a baby, and then since that's his first baby, it would be a legitimate heir to the throne. Oh, no. So the murders were commissioned by the royal family to and the Freemasons, the Freemasons made an appearance in here, to cover up whoever knew about this love child. And the Crown employs William Gall again, Sir William Gall, the Queen's physician, to commit the murders. They killed anyone who knew about this baby. That would have been the whole thing. Mm -hmm. uh, is anybody, is Prince Philip even a real suspect? Probably not. There's many church records that prove the prince was away during all the murders of the young ladies in Whitechapel. Sir William Gull also would have been like 65 and sickly at this point. Like he would have been an old man. Like it would have been probably pretty hard. For him. He died like in 1890, like a year and a half after this shit happened. So I don't think William Gull did any of this. I don't think Philip did any of this. I do think that Philip and his tutor probably had an affair and that Philip might have had syphilis. Uh, he might have even died from that other than the flu. But I just don't think these guys were out killing these young ladies of the night. But if there was a love child out there, like that's a compelling, that's the compelling part about it. If there was actually a love child, they would probably, the royal family would have found a way to kill anybody that knew about it. So I get, I get how that's compelling. I just, there's no proof to it at all. It's just 
Somebody said that. Yeah. No, it's very, very flimsy. However, I am all for rolling rich people under the bus. Yeah. And you take a few lumps here and there. For sure. No, and, and that's why it's fun, right? Because you're taking down a royal. Like, when you just Right. Say- yeah, no, and that's. I think that should be completely accepted in society. We don't need evidence <laughs> to persecute the rich. That's true. I think that <laughs> let them eat cake is all they have to say at this point, and then <laughs> there'll be a riot. So. <laughs> yep. Yeah, we're uh, we're just about there. <laughs> that's what I mean. I think it's close now. All right, so that's the prince. I didn't get. There's so much on the prince. If you guys want to go check it out, I didn't go crazy into him because I find it stupid, but it's cool. It's like it exists. It's just done. Okay. Walter Sickert is the next guy. Walter Sickert was a post-impressionist English painter who was in love with the Jack the Ripper case. He was into the dark and macabre. Jack the Ripper was one of his favorites. One of his paintings is actually called Jack the Ripper's Bedroom. Sickert claimed that he painted this and other uh, another entitled Camden Town Murder in a room that was rented by Jack the Ripper. Okay. Which fucking doesn't make sense. Because, like, we don't know who Jack the Ripper is. So I feel like that's, like, the innkeeper being like, yes, Jack the Ripper used to stay there. I'll take your dumb, dumb money. <laughs> Camden Down Murder depicts a murder that looks like a Jack the, Jack the Ripper MO. I don't know if you guys want to pull that up and look at it. but uh, It's a guy sitting on the edge of a bed with his head towards his clenched hands together. On the bed, there's a lady in nude laying there facing away. doesn't look like that menacing, really, but people keep saying that's like a Jack the Ripper scene. Sicker didn't become involved in the story until like a hundred years later, like a lot of these people. In the 1976 book, Jack the Ripper, The Final Solution, again, Prince Victor thing. Uh, in the Knight's version, in Knight's version, Sicker is just there as an accomplice. So he like saw the murders happen. Like he was around. That's why he could paint this shit. And okay. Yeah. However, in the 1990 crime, uh, 1990 uh, crime writer Jean Overton Fuller in her book, Sickert and the Ripper Crimes, declares Sickert as the actual murderer. Neither the book nor the theory has gained widespread popularity. The theory has been popularized again more recently uh, by crime fiction novelist Patricia Cornwall in 2002. Her book, Portrait of a Killer, Jack the Ripper, Cornwall lays out a very weak case that Sickert was Jack the Ripper. She self-funded a full investigation into Sickert's life. She claims that as a young boy, Sickert had a deformity on his penis. This is the why I'm bringing this one up. Please go on. Yeah, she had a deformity on his penis, which required surgery. And when he got surgery on his penis, the surgery was botched. And she implied, like in her book, she implies that he, it was so botched that he had to squat to pee. And that's how fucked up his dick was. And the botch job left him impotent. So she implied there wasn't even enough penis left for him to get an erection. So she says, uh, which made him hate women, which led to him murdering women. Wow. That track It's clearly their fault for being so sexy and him unable to be turned on by it is a crime. I mean, yeah, for sure. It does make sense though. None of this is true because there's no records of this at all. Sicker did get surgeries as a kid, but by specialists in anal fistula, what do you think that is? Well, maybe that's his, uh, his, his penis is so short, it was actually buried in his ass. It was like a negative penis. Uh, an anal fistula is a small tumor that connects an abscess, infected cavity in the anus to an opening in the skin around the anus. Like, not dick related, but my fuck, no thanks. I don't want a giant hole in my arse like that. No, thank you. But if I, if I, if, if somebody, fucked up my penis beyond all recognition of it being a penis i'd, I'd probably go with that story too i know my surgeries were for uh the the reason i'm so secretive it's an anal fistula it's <laughs> nothing to do with the fact that i thought you would say that but he yeah. had like four wives in his life lots of mistresses he had, even had his kids so are they his kids though <laughs> There's a lot of single moms out there. You gotta check check their genealogy, see if they had any any surgeries for for ass abscesses, and I'll believe you. All right, you you even brought me to the next point, but right, with that, like another bit of evidence that Cornwall brings to the table is DNA. Mitochondrial DNA found on the letters by Sickert match the ones found on some of the Ripper letters, and I do the quotation match thing when I go matched uh, because mm-hmm. mitochondrial DNA for that time would have matched like. 10% like of the population, not just him. So it would have been like, like it's not super accurate DNA. It's like 10% of everyone. So, um, okay. So like 
type of DNA evidence that could lead us to believing that, like, uh, I don't know, like a, a howler monkey could have been Jack close the Ripper. To, exactly. Like, not even close. Gotcha. Even, even like when they go back, Sigurd's like pretty prolific artist. There's writings of him out there. So you go back and you look at the writings, it doesn't match the letter at all. Like, we have shit that we know that's his. So, like, all of this. All of this has been debunked pretty much. I just wanted to tell you guys about the guy's botched dick job and that guy, that lady's idea. Next guy's in the guy named Michael Ostrog. This is another guy, Sir Melville McNaughton's letter, one of the other two guys. Uh, according to McNaughton, Michael Ostrog was a, quote, Russian doctor and convict who subsequently detained a lunatic asylum as a homicidal maniac. Damn. Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> this man antisects I, I don't know what this guy said. I'm quoting this as terrible word. So uh, we're one of the worst possible type and his whereabouts at the time of the murders could never be ascertained. Cool. McNaughton didn't really know much about Ostrog though. He just heard that because if you look into Ostrog, it's pretty bad. So he's a petty thief and a con artist. He was not a doctor at all. McNaughton says he was a Russian doctor. He was not a Russian doctor. Conning people into thinking he was a surgeon in Russia was was one of his cons that's what he used to do all the time he's a non-violent criminal he spent most of his adult life in prisons for thievery and scams the reason mcnaughton listed him as a suspect because he was just released from the asylum when the the murders happened the only reason he was in asylum is because he lied and said he was insane at trial it was the last trial he didn't want to go back to jail so he's like i'm insane and then they put him in an insane asylum he conned them into that like even the nice. people at the time the police that knew him were telling the judge, like, he's scamming it. Don't put him in jail. So, like, they even knew at the time he was full of shit, except for McNaughton. So, McNaughton just thought that he was a Russian doctor. And a bit more spice with the fact that his whereabouts couldn't be traced during the night of the murders. And, uh, like, you just throw that in there, you know? And then that becomes, like, a crazy theory. Sadly, he was discounted not that long ago because um, he was in france they figured out he was in france so mcnaughton's wrong about that guy i don't know about the original guy that he said but this is his last guy mcnaughton so I, i'm cutting ostrog off i just wanted to let you know he's on the letter so i hit on him he's done no not even close the last guy on mcnaughton's uh, memo list i actually talked about him in the first episode you guys probably don't remember was a guy named kosminski aaron kosminski no i remember him yeah good job <laughs> Kosminski was one of the suspects back in 1888 before Melville McNaughton even put him in the suspect letter. He was a Jewish barber that matched the description of the Ripper and had violent tendencies. Officials could never prove that he did a thing and he walked. McNaughton claims that Kosminski was said to have homicidal tendencies and hatred of women. So I, I he just says that cool because of, I guess, later in his life from 1891 till his death, he lived in various insane asylums for threatening his sister with a knife. But like, that's what put him on McNaughton's list. But like, who doesn't pull a knife on their siblings? You know? I, well, yeah, I was just going to say the same Fair thing. argument. I mean, I threatened to kill my brother all the time. I used to. I used to. Yeah. The only reason you don't threaten to kill your sister is because you already killed her. And he didn't even say Aaron Kosminski either in the letter. He just said Kosminski. 2014 researchers claim they've proven Jack the Ripper was Kosminski, though. So apparently one of the police officers investigating the scene of Catherine Edo's murder took an eight foot shawl from the scene. There were stains on the shawl that couldn't be classified, but they assume they could be either blood spatter or semen. How do you not know the difference between those two stains? Uh, I was like, I mm. well, if you're like that one guy with the fucked up dick, they're probably the same thing. That is true. Yeah. I don't know. I feel like when you're doing it by taste, they might not be that far off. <laughs> that is like a great way to project to the world that you've never tasted cum. Good for you. I don't think. <laughs> Thank I, you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. It doesn't taste the same. All right. <laughs> also a great way to project that you've tasted gum. Cool. <laughs> and blood. I, uh, yeah, and <laughs> I have a mustache. All right. There is. <laughs> <laughs> so wait, wait, so is that, is it kind of like, kind of like how you're always like tasting a little bit of the last thing you ate when you, when you have a facial hair, there's just, there's just always blood stains in his mustache. Yeah. Just always blood and cum, man. Yeah. <laughs> just blood and cum though. Yeah. So there's no proof of authenticity of the shawl at all. All we have is the word of this officer's surviving relatives that the shawl is genuinely from the crime scene. The shawl remained in the officer's family until 1991 
when one of the descendants donated the shawl to Scotland Yard's crime museum in 1991. Scotland Yard looked at it and went, I don't know. And they never displayed it ever, disputed its authenticity. In 2007, amateur sleuth and author Russell Edwards bought the shawl from the crime museum for, I don't know how much I tried to figure that out. So he and his team got the shawl and tested the stain and found DNA and claimed the DNA matched the DNA of Kosminski. And they also found a new bodily fluid that hereby to this day is known as Bleeman. <laughs> Not Bleeman. This can't be slut either. <laughs> Slude. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah the dna retrieved was based on seven segments taken in hyper variable regions within the dna so it's not a full 100 percent match but edwards and his team narrowed it down to a match in, of one in twenty nine thousand. uh <laughs> I, apparently it's a good match i don't fucking get it but uh they go like it's solved now it was kuzminski we know because of the shawl wrong there's so many fucking problems with his stupid dna um sir professor alec Jeffries, I guess it's Professor Sir Alec Jeffries. I don't know which you put first on if you're a professor and a sir. Does the sir go first? Well, if you're smart, you you abridge them so you can be professor. <laughs> professor mm. of, yeah. of blue or slewed. <laughs> yeah. uh, professor Sir <laughs> Alec Jeffries in the years since says that the odds of the DNA matching Kosminski are too high because when the DNA tests were done, there was an error in the nomenclature. I don't really know what that means in the scientific sense, but when correcting the error, Sir Jeffries puts the odds down even further. So now down to the, like, to like... So that means the first guy just did the fucking math wrong, right? Yeah. I don't know, like, exactly how that works, but yes, he said he did the math wrong, dude. It's like, now it's inconclusive. Your tests are wrong. So Russell Edwards, though, the guy who wrote the book, still convinced. Crime historian Robert uh, Donald Rumbelo says that the shawl can't even be from the crime scene. There was no mention of it anywhere. Ruben Lowe, like, studies, he's one of, a ripperologist. So there's no claims anywhere of any shawl anywhere. The officer claimed to have stolen the shawl. They looked him up, too. He was working in North London during the time of the murder of Catherine Eddowes. So he would have just never had access to the crime scene or its evidence like even if it is a match it doesn't really mean anything another guy rips apart the dna his name's peter gill he claims that even if the shawl is authentic there was no chain of custody over the past hundred years that stain could be from any number of people someone could have like enjoyed the jack the ripper case so much they jerked off on it it could be anything and then he points out that kuzminski was like actively banging east london sex workers in those days so the amount of people that could have touched a shawl in its hundred years and the, the fact that he could have just like a shit ton of relatives, like not like, you know what I mean? Distant relatives that could have matched with like 150 people in London at the time. Like it could match with so many people. It wouldn't just have to be Kosminski. So this is great grandpa Kosminski shawl. We don't fucking wash it. You understand? <laughs> so one rule. Yeah, exactly. It's just, they, this was like 2014. They claim they solved Jack the Ripper and everyone like tore apart this guy. So. Kosminski was the guy, but I fucking highly doubt it. Doesn't sound it's lame. It's lame as shit. Well, most realities are though. Yeah, exactly. The the end of this is gonna be this one here. I found interesting. Uh, it, it's like the extension of McNaughton's Polish Jew theory. Kosminski, ripperologist and author of the Crimes Detection and Death of Jack the Ripper from 1987, Martin Fido suggests that. Cohen should be the suspect. Now, David Cohen would have been the name of a Jewish person that people couldn't pronounce their rena- real name. That's what they would have called people like John Doe or something. But it would have been, if it's a Jewish guy, they would have called him fucking David Cohen. Jewish guys got their own John Doe? Yeah, they did, which I found Damn. interesting. If you couldn't That's... pronounce her name, you'd just call him David Cohen or whatever. That's David Fuck. Cohen. Fido says that the guy Cohen isn't actually named Cohen. It's a guy named Nathan Kaminsky. So no one ever considered Cohen a suspect until Fido's book was released 100 years later. Uh, this theory is based entirely off the fact that Fido thinks Kosminski was mistaken for Kaminsky. The guy who was uh, Sir Robert Anderson, who was the assistant commissioner of the CID at Scotland Yard at the time of the murders, uh, Anderson claims he was identified by a witness, our buddy Kaminsky. The witness was too scared to come forward. The Jewish people wouldn't tell on each other. That's what they were saying. Like they wouldn't, even if they mm. did know, they wouldn't go to the police and tell them anything about it. They'd deal with it internally. 
In Anderson's 1910 book, The Lighter Side of My Official Life, Anderson claims that the man they were investigating was a guy named Kosminski and that he died shortly after being released from a mental asylum called Colony Hatch. The problem with that statement is that Aaron Kosminski died in 1919, nine years after the book was published. This is why Cohen comes into play, or Kaminsky, because he, he misspelled Kosminski. Uh, so no patient by the name of Kosminski was listed at Colony Hatch during 1889, but he did find a guy named Cohen or John Doe. So after looking into Cohen, you discover that he was admitted into Colony Hatch and for good reasons. A lot of the time uh, while there, he had to be restrained due to his violent tendencies. And he eventually died in October 1888 from exhaustion from mania after several days of being confined to his bed. <laughs> My God, people were assholes back then. Just I don't know what to do with him. Strap him down. He's dead. Okay. Hmm. Did the police get the wrong guy? Is this David Cohen or Nathan Kosminski, the guy? Well, Kaminsky was a tailor and he lived right in the heart of Whitechapel. Kaminsky disappears at a certain point in 1888, but that's just about when Cohen appears. Uh, there's a Jewish man in December, 1888, walking and rambling down the street. He didn't speak English and was brought to the police station. The Jewish man was, wasn't cooperative and booked into the workhouse as David Cohen or John Doe. So when Coben became violent, they transferred him to the assignment where he ended up dying. After this, there's no record of Kaminsky. Kaminsky matched the description of the leather apron, according to Fido. And Kaminsky also had been treated for syphilis, meaning he probably frequented the brothels. If it's not Kaminsky, maybe it's Kaminsky. Kind of interesting. I don't know. The John Doe thing I thought was interesting. Um, yeah. Kaminsky, too. Another big thing about that guy is people look at him over the years. And he's like a complete idiot. Like he literally told people that he wouldn't take food from others or take a bath, but then he, he would eat from gutters. Like this is the kind of guy that everyone thinks is Jack the Ripper. He's a moron. That's just, that's just pride, dude. What was he eating from gutters though? Just junk, whatever's in there. It's fucking gross. Because I've had New York fusion. It doesn't mean that it's not good. It's just hipster. Yeah. He was a hipster. That's, that's what it was. If he had like fried calamari out of a gutter, he is a visionary. He would probably be wearing the same beanie as you too. What is what did you call it? New York Fusion? What is that? I'm not I'm old. It's rich people food not snob stuff. You take you take two different categories and you fuse them together but it's usually super super like expensive but also kind of shitty but nobody admits it's shitty. If you didn't realize Rick is fully one of the guys that falls into those traps. Yeah, but I do it at home on the cheap. So if anyone's looking to, to, <laughs> here's, to here's die, my fusion: dying. peanut butter and a hot dog. I like to fuse <laughs> disgusting and mediocre together. Welcome to Richard Getz's kitchen. <laughs> he did do that before. Uh, all right, we have one more, and then we got two more, basically. So Thomas Cutbush. We got one more, and then we've got two more. Well, no, one more suspect. And then my my theory. Hey, is, hey, man, I'm telling you, on the other end, this, this is how it feels. You got one more and then two more and then one more. We're on day like 15 of Jack the Ripper. Day three for you. Day 103 <laughs> for me. Yeah. Yeah. He's He's been fully immersed and he's trying to boil us like frogs in water, which pretty soon this will just be a Jack the Ripper podcast. Thomas Hayne Cutbush. Thomas Cutbush was an only child growing up. His father left his family for New Zealand when he was a kid. So he grew up with his mom and his aunt, both of whom were said to have had some sort of neurological disorder. Is his name Cutbush? Cutbush, yeah. Cutbush. Cutbush. One word. Not an unethical fan, I take it. No, yeah, cut that bush down. This guy's a douchebag. <laughs> yeah, so he started working at an early age to support the family, but couldn't hold down a job because he had violent tendencies. Part-time, he would study medical texts because he had a dream of becoming a doctor as a child. In 1888, he was 22 years old and he was suffering from delusions because of the syphilis he'd contracted from the ladies of the street he frequented. He was arrested for his peculiar behavior and eventually locked up in an insane asylum at Lambeth. That only lasted four days as Cutbush was convinced the doctors were poisoning him. So he jumped the fence and the police at the time didn't chase him. They just let him go. And in 1891, after the last canonical woman, Francis Cole, was murdered, Cutbush was arrested for stabbing sex workers in the butt. <laughs> stabbing them in the butt cheeks. Yeah, Cutbush was taking it out on some butts. <laughs> What a yeah. what a funny way to be an absolutely heinous public menace. Like, yeah, no, he's just fucking banging a sex worker and then just stabbing them in the ass. Like, 
fucking asshole. Yeah, really? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> making, self-replicating asshole. Making more. He was put into the high security Broadmoor Hospital for an indefinite amount of time at the order of Her Majesty, which I found hilarious that it was described like that. Cut Bush stayed at Broadmoor until his death in 1903. In a series of articles in the British tabloid, The Sun, they accused Cut Bush of being Jack the Ripper. Cut Bush would threaten staff at the hospital with ripping them with a knife. Just a delusional fuck. This guy was brain damaged, like mental health issues, right? He's, he's a little royal, was he? Yeah, he's mm. a little royal. People at the time didn't even believe that he was the guy. First of all, he was only 22 at the time of the murders. So all the victims, like there's 13 suspects that saw Jack jack the ripper and it wasn't a 22 year old guy it was like a guy in his 40s the whole reason mcnaughton wrote his memo with the three suspects was to refute the son's accusations toward Cutbush. he was trying to like fight against the fucking media which was fucked at the time so in 1993 essay authored by ap wolf entitled jack the myth a new look at the ripper suggests that mcnaughton was actually covering for Cutbush because Cutbush was related to another high-ranking officer in scotland yard at the time a few authors and ripperologists still think that Cutbush is our guy, but like literally that's all it is. He stabbed a sex worker in the butt one time and then went to the insane asylum and then everyone blew it up over it. So the sun vilifying mental health and it's like just a lazy way to do it. So that's all the suspects that I'm willing to get into. Uh, <laughs> there's still like hundreds. Call in if you feel like you are a Jack the Ripper suspect. <laughs> Have you been ripping? Have you been ripping for more than 100 years? Give us a call. one 855 prvtdix today. So last one is probably what we're all thinking. Unless you guys have anything you want to throw into this before we go. Before I go into this. Well, it's gonna um, be I know this is uh, going to gonna be old hat. And, you know, we always we always fall back on it as a, you know, as a as a gag, but I would be remiss not to <laughs> blame extremely violent maulings on on a, on a wear creature of some sort. I think that would be, I mean, because I mean, imagine if, you know what I mean, somehow it did come out that that was the case and we of all people did not throw our, our, our sure. hat into the ring on that one. For We'd sure. feel oof, foolish, yeah. sir. Yeah, if, if foolish. like ca- lycanthropy ends up being the the reason they figure that out somehow and then we didn't say that egg on our face and didn't they actually call him a werewolf (laughs) (laughs) i mean really like (laughs) werewolves of london (laughs) i'm pretty certain i figured it out okay are we there are we there yet if that's what you want to do, would you like me to go? He's just going to say where werewolves because he wasn't listening for the past. No, I'm not. <laughs> no, I have a really good one, actually. <laughs> so time travels for real. <laughs> dun, 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 Let's dun, just dun, add that into dun, the dun, theory. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> time travel of London. <laughs> That is that is my favorite War from Zevon sequel song. Or it's going to be real. And the person that invents it, Richard's children invent time travel oh my children do okay yeah Yeah. and that's why none of these theories make sense because what they have yet to figure out is it's more than one person working together (laughs) and all along well what's going to happen is richard's crazy obsession with jack the ripper and paying so much attention to it his kids realize the only way for them to get noticed by their father is to travel back in time and be jack the ripper <laughs> dude that's that is pretty fucking good yeah i like that i'm also i'm also laughing so hard because now i'm singing in my head oscar the time traveling werewolf of london <laughs> listen I, I don't know how many hours total we're in on this but i've been holding that one in for a long time Oh, not as long on. as I've been researching it, and not as long as my kids have been anticipating me to be done. I know they know too. They know too. That's the <laughs> issue. <They know> too. <laughs> oh, what was that flash? Oscar comes back with like a bunch of cuts. What, what, what happened? <laughs> it's pretty funny. Uh, 
Okay, so <laughs> that kind of ruins my life. <laughs> okay, the good, the best answer is time travel, my kids. That's I think that's the real solve of this entire thing. Actually, at the end of this, yeah. Well, uh, uh, I do the time to... traveling were off of London. Anyways, I'm gonna. I will go through this last three because it is my reality, like what I actually think it is. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how I'm gonna outdo that though. <laughs> yes, I think this is all made up. I think this is a bunch of different people killing a bunch of different people. It's not one guy. Uh, maybe one guy did a couple things. I think the media just invented Jack the Ripper. Well, in fact, we know the media invented Jack the Ripper. If you guys remember the first episode, the guy literally admitted to making sending the letters. Yeah. No, okay. it's just like how the media invented, you know, uh, Donald Trump. Like, he's not a real guy. <laughs> that never happened. I think P- I'm not disputing the murders happened. I'm disputing that it's all done by one person. No, I am. Anything that I don't like, the media is media invented. There's a lot of things that make it look like it's one guy. Okay. All the murders were done with the left hand, apparently. So they had to be left handed. But like we talked about that in the first episode, just because they killed someone with the left hand doesn't mean they're left handed every time. He could have just been busy in the other hand. No, I feel like that was a theory made up by people who didn't understand that mirrors exist also. Like they just didn't understand angles and perspective you you i'm sorry i misunderstood you i thought so when you're saying that you think multiple people did it you think multiple different people like richard rj i thought you were saying that jack the ripper experienced a lot of growth in between each kill and that he himself (laughs) felt like he was an individual different person through each of those different journeys and that i agreed with oh brought to by the media that is that does make sense that rick would say that because i did read rick's self-published book uh, learning about yourself through murdering hookers <laughs> while and reading the, poetry. Yeah. <laughs> and the black door abyss behind me. Yeah. So the left hand thing, there's the, the, all the women's throats were cut right down to the spine. I feel like that would have been, I'm sorry, but that's kind of psycho guy would have done that anyway. Well, yeah. I mean, they all hated women judging yeah. by how they treated them. Yeah. Constantly. Uh, they they even just get labeled all as prostitutes. That's what the whole thing is. And even mm-hmm. though like people actually went looked into these ladies and figured out, hey, maybe a couple of these were just like desperate and did it once, you know? It wasn't like they were always yeah. prostitutes. Whitechapel would have been dangerous. Crazy shit would have happened there. Uh people were sleeping on fucking ropes. Like people were sucking dicks to sleep on ropes. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like and uh, some it, heroes were sucking dicks so that their boyfriend could pursue his writing career. Exactly. Exactly. So even if they were a prostitute, that doesn't necessarily mean they weren't angels in disguise. And <laughs> they, they, they lump it all together because of all this stuff, plus the letters. But we'll get into the letters in a bit. There's a bunch of things that don't make sense, though, that don't connect. They're not similar enough for me to want to put them together. Right. Like the five canonical uh, murders. Four of them are in their 40s, except for the last victim. She's 20. And four of the five murders are done in the streets, except for the last lady. She's done inside of a house. Four murders in one month, then skips two months and it happens again. Seems fucking weird to me. This, to me, screams like the last one when it just comes back after two months. This shit screams readership is down. Sell Mm. some more papers. Uh, We got to do something, right? Yeah. Uh, Three out of the five victims were mutilated post-mortem. Two were rushed. That's how they explain away those ones. But like, maybe, maybe not. Maybe that was just the kill. You know, the mutilations were done by someone with medical knowledge. We don't know if that's 100% accurate either. It's disputed by the medical examiners. uh, If that looked at the scenes, if Jack the Ripper even had medical knowledge, especially for the last one. The last one, there's the two guys that did the uh, two medical examiners that looked at the body. One of them said he had medical knowledge. The other one said there's no way he had medical knowledge. So that's just being lumped into the category because that's what they want us to think about it, right? He had medical knowledge, so it makes the story better. The double event, when the two ladies were killed on the same night, uh, is that the same person? I don't think so. It's too far away for someone to get from murder to murder without it have been very obvious. Mm-hmm is there's theories out there that I think this is linked together by hysteria rather than fact. Dr. Bond, even like the guy who connected them and wrote a profile about Jack the Ripper. He wanted this to be true. Confirmation bias. I believe that hundred percent. I, I think it's the same as the Zodiac, right? With the media just. Yeah. I was going to say the same thing. I hope you're happy with yourself by going through all of these episodes, just to recycle the Zodiac solve. <laughs> 
it's just what I think of it after it. It's literally what I think of it after it. I don't know what to say. I read so much and like, I don't know. It's just. Could you imagine being the guy in the media that made this up? And then like the years and years and years of people just like talking about it. And after researching all of it, getting to the end of it. And they're like, nah, the media did it. But you still read through it all and you still gave them exactly sure. what they wanted. For sure. Yeah. I, 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 I know the irony of the entire thing. I, I fucking I understand it. <laughs> Trust me more than I want to. Keep pumping, Fox. Keep pumping. Me is very much a societal mirror. You know what I mean? Like, because it's 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 very much everyone who watches fault as it is their fault because you're feeding it with rather intentionally or unintentionally. But even being mad at it is feeding it. It's like an impossible you know, fucking catch 22. But it's not, I don't feel like I wasted the time though. I like, I find it interesting. I find it fun. No, it's good. That's where I, that's where my head was at with it for a long time. Is that like, this is just a bunch of pieces of shit because everyone back then was a piece of shit. They were uh, like during the Jack the Ripper thing, they're selling 300,000 copies of the paper every single day. After the Ripper stopped, mm-hmm. it was like 10,000. So obviously they're going to keep that rolling, right? Like mm-hmm. I, I, it's, it just yep. makes so much sense to me that it was like, yes, probably two of them are connected. I would say some of them might be connected. I don't think they're all connected. And I think they probably could have caught someone if they didn't connect them. You know, if they didn't just go like automatically to that, I think the media actually fucked over everyone to figuring Mm -hmm. this out forever, like forever. Uh, And just for, for ad sales. So, so maybe Rick, possibly, maybe, maybe it's not so dark. Maybe Oscar didn't actually go back and murder these women himself. Maybe he became a newspaper tycoon, (laughs) just a media magnate. In order to do this. I don't think the last girl would have even died had it not been for the media. I think they made it such a thing that somebody went, I'm going to be Jack the Ripper tonight and fuck up this chick. Hmm. I, I think I think the media killed someone else. I, I legit. I mean, that. if you're really going to if you're really going to hurt your son's conscience like that. I mean, <laughs> did society get better over time or is no. Jamie Lee Curtis going to look back negatively on the Halloween franchise? Like, is someone going to bring that to a thing? I don't, I'm having a very difficult time seeing the connection and I feel like the disconnect has something to do with the vape pen you just hit 45 seconds. Wait, you don't understand the reference to Jamie Lee Curtis and the Halloween, like the Friday, Michael Myers? Or why is that relevant is what you're saying? Because if it's this whole thing where it's just like people start like repeating things that they see in the media, you don't think we'd see a lot more killings that were related to like the way that it was done in the Halloween movies? Oh, I well, so I interpreted what Richard said. I mean, also, yes, people have died that way. All they did was stab them. Like, <laughs> Yeah, but like like town-wide type of like... Tr- but there's been, there's been dudes sure. that have taken movies and went out and killed like the movie. It's happened. It's not even like a, a non... Like an impossibility for that to happen. It's happened already. Yeah, I mean, not not to say that media is responsible. I think what I, what I interpreted Richard meaning was like that that piece of shit was already going to kill somebody. Yes. Um, and use it as sort of a cover, which is still the media's fault. Um, but I, there's a I feel like there's a pretty big gap in 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 people's media literacy between sleeping on ropes and being filthy all the time and a John Carpenter film like that. There's a, there's a stretch of time in there (laughs) where people had maybe some, some growth as a society. Yeah. And a hundred percent. Yes. Who knows? Somebody might actually go and fucking be where Halloween mask and do it. You never know. It hasn't happened yet, but during that time, we should do it. We should be the ones. They were definitely fanning the flames for this. And like, did it make someone go kill like a a whack job just so he could get away with it? Because I was already going to kill this lady or I was going to kill someone. Now I can do it like this. And it's Jack the Ripper. Like, Hmm. I think that happened. That's what I think happened. Uh, The fact that Oscar went back in time and did that is very disappointing to me. I tried to raise him as a good. Oh, dude, you can't say that. He did it all so that you you'd be proud of. No, but that's the thing. It's like that's the irony of his whole trip is that now I'm even more disappointed in him than I was before. (laughs) Do you think at some point. Um, yeah, women went ending. out to Halloween parties <laughs> dressed up as Jack the Ripper. It's like in a slutty Jack the Ripper costume. Dre- slutty Jack the Ripper? Like like back in the day. Oh, and then killed themselves for being a whore? No, no, no. no, <laughs> no yeah, but... I do think that may have happened. Yeah, that's a good point, Rick. I like that you came up with that. 
I just watch Private Dicks and I think RJ's the funniest. What? Come on! Hey there, all you private dickheads. That's probably not the name we're going to stick with. Anyways, uh, RJ here. I am here to tell you thank you for listening to another episode of Private Dicks. If you liked what you heard, go on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, anywhere they take your reviews, drop us five stars, say something nice. Also, what you just heard was from last season. If you want current episodes as they're dropped, head on over to patreon.com and search up Unethical Podcast. That's our mother podcast. I was not aware Private Dicks was a spinoff. I'm going to renegotiate my contract. On Patreon is a full 16 episode season more of Private Dicks, uncut videos of each episode, and many more things are getting added all the time. You can also find all of Unethical's content on there, so go listen to that. And if you're already a patron, fuck yeah, dude. You're the best. Thank you.